Um, so I want to talk about what we came up with in Jephthah's Daughters, which is where we tried to find scholars in the humanities. There were 17 of us from around the world. A lot of us were raised by gay couples. Um, and we uh, tried to map out what we saw the next 100 years of children's rights struggles looking like. And we broke it down into six sections, as you see on the left. We had a section on children. We had a section on women, a section on society, a section on global relationships, a section on the gay community itself, and then a section on free speech, all right? But what I'm gonna to argue to you today is that what's next for children's rights? I think it's the global. That's gonna be one of the most important because um, a lot of things that are going on on the global level will eventually flow back to the United States. Um, and so it, that's where it deserves a lot of our attention. The chapters on the globe focus on these seven different areas. So we had one scholar who looked at the impact of the LGBT movement on linguistic minorities. For instance, English is one of the rare languages where gender is irrelevant to things like declension or articles or adjectives, right? Uh, but that's rare in almost the entire world. And so this English-speaking movement is basically going in and forcing itself on many different linguistic communities. One of the examples there was in Scotland, Gaelic is an endangered language. And right now it's very difficult for them to maintain the teaching of Gaelic because of the new diversity requirements that are being imposed on them by the transgender movement. All right? Um, if you go down, we, we looked at the effects on Europe, on Africa, on Asia, but the three chapters at the bottom are the ones that I want to talk about today, okay? Um, what is the impact of this on issues that are really important to the Latino community, to the American Indian community, and the African American community? And it may seem like a little bit of a stretch at first glance, but I just want to read to you some of this so you can understand how this law is going to affect children's rights um, in a way uh, at a crossroads with racial issues. So the first one is the chapter Borders and Blood. Okay, and this chapter is about what happened in the summer of 2014 as all of the court cases were moving up towards the Obergefell decision. And there were somewhere around 50,000 unaccompanied minors from Latin America who were intercepted at the U.S.-Mexico border. Do you guys remember this? Okay, so let me read this. The same-sex marriage debate has altered the way we discuss family reunification, kinship, foster care, social intervention, and adoption. Immigration reformists routinely cite the reunification of families as a central urgency requiring the government to decriminalize people who immigrated illegally. Latino and LGBT advocacy groups are vague about whether immigration law should protect children by bringing their father and mother into the country under some kind of waiver or by making it easier for couples in the United States to sever children from one or both of their biological parents and adopt them under a special visa. Whose child is this and what is the family that you are reuniting the child with is a very important question, but we couldn't ask that question in that context because of the debate about same-sex marriage. An official statement from the National Association of Latino Elected Officials provides a list of reasons for the necessity of immigration reform. High on the list is keeping families together. So this comes from Naleo's list of priorities of immigration reform. Quote, currently large immigration backlogs prevent many U.S. citizens um, uh, from re swiftly reuniting with their family members. It is important that our immigration policies recognize the efforts of individuals that have petitioned for loved ones through legal channels and then we institute measures to ensure family reunification and a substantial reduction of the family backlogs. At the same time, the Human Rights Campaign, the largest gay rights organization, also has a document about its goals for immigration reform. And let me read from that. It says this, quote, inside the Reuniting Families Act in immigration reform, this would reduce current immigration backlogs in order to ensure that families navigating our immigration system are reunited more quickly. Among other, among other reforms, the act would, would reduce wait times by amending a section of the INA so that lawful permanent resident spouses, children, and same-sex parents are classified as immediate relatives. The 
the AHRC must refer simultaneously to at least two family units, the biological pair of mother and father and the adoptive pair of man uh, and, and man or woman, woman, who has adopted the child. Naleo and HRC have never sat down at the table and established how we can overcome the conflict between these two divisions of family. And this is a major issue because for a lot of gay couples who want to adopt out of foster care, you have to ask, where are the children coming from in foster care? In fact, the Obama government contracted a host of religious charities paying, among others, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops $30 million and the Baptist Child and Family Services $289 million to transition these children into the foster care of American homes. That is where the children at the border ended up. So who do they belong to? Do you see the problem? Why did we come up with this conflict? Why, did, why was it so taboo to even bring this up or even ask the question? To this day, we don't have, I haven't been able to find a public accounting of where these children ended up and whether they actually were with their mother and father, right? Um, how did we get here? Well, the debate about same-sex marriage created a situation which, in order for the LGBT movement to attain its goals, people had to be comfortable looking past biological kinship in favor of, which, of whichever custodial arrangement was most loving, wanted, planned, or in the child's best interest. Those are the most common words that they used in determining this. And advocates for gay parenting have not been secretive about their ultimate goal, which is to create a system where children belong to adults who want them, not adults who conceive them. In Washington, D.C. on June 20th, 2013, Nancy Polyakov testified before the City Council Committee on Public Safety and the Judiciary. She was pushing um, a, a, a plan to repeal the capital's law against gestational surrogacy. Balot Polakoff is a, a long-standing and highly respected scholar for LGBT rights. She begins by explaining that gay people need family to be redefined so that they can found families in the first place. The legalization of surrogacy and with it the drastic redefinition of human kinship is justified because it's necessary to match the demands of the LGBT community. This is a direct quote from her speech which she delivered before um, Washington, D.C. For more than 20 years, the advocates for lesbian and gay parents have emphasized that genetics is neither necessary nor sufficient to create parentage. In 2008 and 2009, I worked with the Committee on Parentage Legislation, which the City Council enacted, in ensuring that when a lesbian couple plans for a child conceived through donor insemination, both women are the legal parents of that child. Now, to say that genetics is neither necessary nor sufficient to create parentage is to change the way we think about human existence in very profound ways. Where we come from, whom we're supposed to cherish, whom we're supposed to obey, whom, we're, whom we mourn, and whom we're supposed to love. All those things are being drastically redefined in a sideways, almost kind of um, tangential way. It's like the, the tail wagging the dog. Um, it, it is automatically in the best interest under this system of every human being to be under the emotional sway of people with means and intent to acquire a person at a young age. Um, and this creates a very difficult situation for the Latino immigration crisis because where are most of the um, gay couples going to be looking to get children? Unfortunately, it is a market and a large number of them are going to be people who were separated from their parents because one of their parents was not in the country legally. Um, and so we have on a collision course what the gay movement is asking for in terms of immigration and what the Latino movement is asking for in immigration. Now, by writing the majority opinion for U.S. versus Windsor, which was decided just two weeks after that speech from Nancy Polakoff, this was in June 2013, Justice Kennedy blithely tossed in a reference to children of same-sex couples, and here he was principally delivering an opinion involving a lesbian, Edith Windsor, who was suing the federal government over taxes, not over parenthood. So it was actually quite irrelevant for him to put this in there, but this is what Justice Kennedy wrote. Quote, by this dynamic, DOMA undermines both the public and private significance of state-sanctioned same-sex marriage, for it tells those couples in all the world that their otherwise valid marriages are unworthy of federal recognition. This places same-sex couples in the unstable position of being in a second-tier marriage, and it humiliates tens of thousands of children now being raised by same-sex couples. So the focus was on humiliation, but the humiliation that, that counted in the eyes of the court was the child was being raised by gay couples, 
not a child who's been taken away by parents who are poor or who are experiencing some hardship or who have a difficult immigration status. You guys follow? So that's an important area that we have to try to consider um, going forward in the aftermath of Obergefell because this is going to become even more complicated. Immigration is going to become very vexed with that. Um, I want to skip ahead um, and, and talk about um, another chapter, Cowboys and Indians. Okay, and here's where, this is about the future of the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was passed in 1978, okay? And this was a law that had been passed um, in reaction to what had happened when many um, Native American reservations had been depopulated through adoption. And very often, predominantly white social workers would come to Native American reservations, they would say these people are dirty, they're not taking care of them, there's too much alcoholism, we need to you know, remove them and place them in a fitting home or proper home, which was typically a white home. And this is kind of seen within Native American history as one of the traumatic events of, of the late 19th and 20th century. Now it's interesting that um, the day before U.S. versus Windsor was decided, there was a case called the Baby Veronica case that was at the Supreme Court. How many of you have heard of that? You guys know that? Okay. Justice, this, let me just give you the, the background of it. Baby Veronica was a baby whose father had a very, very small amount of Native American blood. And he had impregnated a Latino woman, and then he was deployed in the army. While he was away, she adopted the child out to a white couple. Now he signed away his paternity, but then he later on said, I was in Afghanistan, I was not in my right mind, I want custody of this child. Under the Indian Child Welfare Act, if one of the two parents of a Native American child is available to parent, you have to place that child there to maintain their cultural connection rather than placing it with a white family. So this became a court case. The Cabo Biancos, which were a white family that lived in South Carolina, fought to keep the child, and the Native American uh, father was fighting to get his, his biological daughter back. You guys follow? It was complicated because the Latina mother um, had a disagreement with the father and did not want him to raise her daughter. So she was fighting to have the child remain with the white couple. So this went all the way up to the Supreme Court. What's interesting is only one justice voted to preserve the Indian Child Welfare Act, and that is essentially to prioritize the biological ties between the child and the parent in that sense, and also voted against same-sex marriage in the U.S. versus Windsor case the next day. Can you guys guess which justice did that? Scalia, the one who's gone. It's kind of interesting. He voted with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan to maintain the emphasis on biological or cultural heritage in the Indian Child Welfare Act case, and then he voted basically on the same logic against same-sex marriage. Now this leads me to believe, when I look at this, um, that there's a whole lot of cognitive dissonance on both wings of the Supreme Court, where there was, because it would seem to me that people like Alito and Clarence Thomas um, didn't, why were they voting against same-sex marriage? It seems to be that they have a moral aversion to homosexuality and it wasn't really focused as much on the child, or at least that wasn't front and center. Um, you know, partly, well, I'll read some of the passages of the decision so you can decide for yourself because of the specific cases of baby Veronica were very 